<laughs> you are here for the live fireside chat, New Frontiers of the Enneagram with Chip Conley and Russ Hudson. This is going to be fun. And for those of you, I, I recognize a lot of faces here, some new ones, but you know how we like to be interactive and engaged uh, on these calls. So for those of you, we're going to do a chat waterfall here. For those of you that know about Enneagram, what's your number? Put your number in the chat if you know it. Hey, and for those of you that, that don't know and are here to, that's why you're here, to, to learn more about it. Let's see our numbers. We've got people coming in from all over the world too. So it's great to see you all here. Uh, I'd like to bring up Chip and Russ to introduce yeah. you. Many of you, most of you here, know Chip Conley, but for those of you who are here for the first time, uh, Chip is a rebel hospitality entrepreneur, a New York Times bestselling author, and the founder of the Modern Elder Academy, the world's first midlife wisdom school, offering workshop retreats at our beautiful oceanfront campus in Baja, Mexico, and new campuses coming next year in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Hi, Chip. Hey, Leslie. And hi. Leslie and, has a birthday this week. I'm not oh, going to say which one, but it, she's got a big birthday. <laughs> and big we are, we love you, Leslie. <laughs> oh, love you too. Um, and Russ Hudson has established himself as one of the top teachers and developers of the Enneagram personality typology in the world today. He's been writing and teaching full-time with the Enneagram Institute as well as on his own since 1991 and has co-authored five best-selling books on the subject including the wisdom of the Enneagram and personality types. Welcome, Russ. And I'll well, let you, you guys take it away. <laughs> yes. Well, Russ, what an honor. Um, you know, you are someone I deeply admire. And um, I have, uh, I started studying the Enneagram when I was in my early 20s. Uh, and I, I did so partly because I was seeing a, a therapist and I was going through a lot in my life. And I, she said, you know, you got to really understand what's underneath the surface. Most of the personality type tests out there just sort of tell you what's on the surface. And I had no idea what she was talking, <laughs> what she was meant. And then she sent me to this woman named Helen Palmer in, in Berkeley, California. And I went through a, a an extended course in person with, with Helen Palmer. And, and that's when I really learned how, how valuable this tool is. And when I started my boutique hotel company at age 26, uh, Joie de Vivre, we had something called Joie de Vivre University. And one of the classes that anybody in the company, all 3,500 employees ultimately had was the ability to actually take a course on the Enneagram because we felt like it was such a beautiful tool uh, mm -hmm. within organizations. Tell us about your history with the Enneagram and, and how you got interested in it and uh, and, and, and help help everybody understand a little bit more about what it is. All right. Well, thank you, Chip. And thank you for having me. Uh, yeah. it's, a, it's an honor for me to be here with everybody. It, it feels really good. Um, ah, so where did I, how did I get into this? It's like everything. Things happen through relationships. Things happen through connections. Um, as a young man, I, for better or worse, got really interested in this question of, you know, what's our purpose? Why are we here? Is there some way we can awaken something more fundamental in our humanity? And I was a young man in the 1970s. So there were all sorts of people laying out their, uh, <laughs> their uh, wares at that time along those lines, Eastern and Western. And I was checking out all kinds of things. And at some point, I ran into the teachings of uh, a Western teacher named Gurdjieff. And he was talking about how humanity was asleep, but could awaken. He was talking about why that happened. He was talking about the, what we call centers of intelligence and that awakening required the activation and harmonization of these different intelligences that a person has, et cetera. And all of this made perfect sense to me. Uh, but the Gurdjieff work, the real Gurdjieff work does not advertise and they're kind of hidden. So it took me some uh, sleuthing, but I eventually found the, the Gurdjieff work. I studied with people who lived with Gurdjieff for a long time. And uh, that my interest was in his take on it, which was if you can see the mechanics 
mechanical nature, the habitual nature of your personality. In the moment that you see it, there's something more there than is usually the case. So in other words, it's kind of presence or awareness with content. So I got interested from that point of view. And then much later in the late 1980s, I encountered um, a few articles, but then Don Richard Riso's first book, Personality Types, which was the first major book about the Enneagram of personality that was available to the public. Um, and I read that book and I was fascinated because I felt that these descriptions were very congruent with this idea from Gurdjieff. And additionally, the symbol of the Gurdjieff work was the Enneagram. It was the symbol of what he called the fourth way, which means the spiritual way in the midst of ordinary life. So, um, yeah, I, I read that book a couple of times, and then Helen Palmer's book came out about a year later, and suddenly there was this new interest in this system. Uh, but as it turned out, Don Riso lived less than a mile away from me. I live in Manhattan, wow. New York City. And I called him up, and to make a long story short, uh, we started a conversation. And when I got laid off from a, a corporate job here, he invited me to come work with him initially as an assistant. And so it all kind of developed out from there. But my initial interest in it was, was not to go around and put people in categories, it was how does this tool help us live a more awake, compassionate, courageous life? That for me was always the point of it. Mm. And and how is it different than say Myers Briggs or all of the other, especially the corporate kind of personality typing tools that are out there? How, how, you know, do you, I'm sure you have an answer to this because you probably ask this all the time. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, people do, and I think all of those models have their place. I think a lot of the corporate tools, DISC or or Myers Briggs and so forth they talk about how we approach things. And so they can be useful, but I find in general, people are not shocked at the results. Like if you find out you're a, a ENTJ and you find, read what that is, yep, that's me. And it, it's not really a surprise. It's just describing your methodology, your approach to problems and, and to people and all sorts of things. And that's useful. But the Enneagram is not as popular sometimes in corporate settings because it's riskier, because it answers why you are that way. Mm. So like, let's say I'm quote, a type A personality, a go-getter, right? There's a lot of different reasons why a person might have that kind of approach. And the Enneagram isn't just saying, oh, you're a go-getter, it's showing the underlying motivation to that, which gets more into vulnerable places in the psyche. But what I learned in the many years of teaching this and in my own journey was that if you don't go to those vulnerable places, we can only imagine growth or development or change. It, it just doesn't happen. We have to be willing to sort of roll up our sleeves and get into it. So sometimes if I'm working with executives or people in companies, I ask them right out of the gate, are you willing to do that? If you are, I, I'll be there for you in every form I can. If you're not, let's not waste each other's time because mm. nothing is going to change for you. <laughs> you know, so so there's that. Those are those are good on a certain level, but if you want to get down under the hood, under the bonnet, we'd say in the UK, mm -hmm. you, 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 the Enneagram is more about that. Yeah, you know, it, it, Richard Rohr, who you know, because yeah. Richard, Richard has spoken and uh, written about the Enneagram as well. He was a student. He came here in December 2021 to Lynn oh. Twist's Soul of Money workshop as oh. a student at age 78, after having written 50 books. Um, and he he ended up talking a lot about the Enneagram. The Enneagram, he, even though he was a student, he was teaching a little bit about it. And what he said it was something about the idea if Carl Jung had known about the Enneagram, he would have talked a lot more about it because Carl Jung spoke to this idea that it's the, it's the, it's what's under, underneath the surface, the, the unconscious that has control over us. And I, I, I sort of see there's a lot of truth to that for 
the Enneagram is that it's, it helps you to understand what's underneath the surface. As you said, um, talk, to, maybe talk to us about each of the nine types, just for, for those who are not familiar. Um, let's, let's have Russ's, you know, brief r- review of each of the nine types. Yes. Yeah. And, and yes, and, and Richard is a dear friend has been for many years. We've taught together several times. We always have a blast and Lynn also, yeah, yeah they, you oh, guys are super great uh, pals there. Yeah. Uh, so the, the points, I usually start with point eight instead of point one. Hmm. And the reason is that the, the arrangement of them is not random. The Enneagram isn't just a grab bag of traits, although some people teach it that way. It is not the fact. There's an underlying logic to why the types work out the way they do. So the first grouping sits at the top of the Enneagram symbol. If you see the circle, right at sitting at the top are eight, nine, and one, with nine right at the top. That These types are related to embodiment, energy, kinesthetic awareness, that those kind of intuitive hunches where you just know or feel something in your gut. They're all different relationships with that. So one way I always talk about this is that, yes, there are people who are Enneagram 8s, but it's also important for all of us, what is my relationship to the part of humanity that 8 represents? So I'm going to talk about it that way. So 8 represents our aliveness, our vividness, the energy that gets me out of bed in the morning, my kind of a capacity to be strong in life, to take on the world, to meet challenges, to be bold in life. Uh, and some people have a lot of that and some people not so much. Everybody has some, but we have some relationship with it. People who are Enneagram 8s exhibit a lot of those characteristics. They are go-getters. They're strong. They speak their mind. They're straight up. Uh, and they often are initiators. They're people who like to start companies. They're people who like to make things happen. Um, a lot of entrepreneurs, but even people of humble economic means could still be an eight and still have that kind of energy and drive. Now, the downside is, and each one has a beautiful gift, and there's a downside. The downside is that when we're not present with ourselves, when we're not in contact with ourselves, we do an ersatz version of the real thing that gets us in trouble. So the ersatz substitute version of eight is kind of pushing myself, driving myself, creating conflicts that where I really don't need to. I I start to feel like I'm at war with life, at war with the world, like nobody's cooperating. I got to make you guys get your act together. And it's a very stressful way of being for me. A lot of eights Uh, die young, but they don't even get to be elders because they burn themselves out. And they, they wear out other people and harm their relationships with a kind of excessive forcefulness. My father so, is an my father's an eight, and he yeah. arrived last night uh, to spend a week with me here in Baja. And that is my father. Everything you've just described is my father. <laughs> and it, you know, it, it, it's sometimes hard. People can sometimes be a little bit intimidated by eights because they're yes. so powerful. They're they can be bossy. They're, they they don't recognize the effect they're having on other people. Yes, that's absolutely it. It's like I'm not aware that I'm using more energy than I need to. Eights often have big hearts. They're really caring people. They're really loving people. But this other energy kind of gets ahead of them. And then they've got to pick up the pieces. All right, let's go to the nine. Okay, the nine is the next door neighbor. So it's also about embodiment. But nine is about our capacity to be. It's about our capacity to be, which doesn't mean checking out. It means our ability to be with the experience we're having, to be with the people that we're with, to flow with whatever's going on. Probably, you know, nines created that expression, I go with the flow, right? They certainly want to. And in their better moments, they do. Nines can be super creative. They have a deep inner uh, sensibility. They're, a lot of their attention is more inward directed. Uh but they're they like things to be smooth. They like they're they're easygoing, they're friendly, they're often picked as leaders because people trust them. Mm. They, you know, people figure they'll be fair. There have probably been more US presidents who are nines than any other type for that reason. Mm. Uh they they like to bring things together, they tend to have a holistic view, look at the big picture. 
they're always looking at how things connect and how we might have a more unified experience of life. Mm -hmm. And that can happen through creativity, business, leadership, you name it. There's no career I can think of where you wouldn't find nines. Uh, the downside of nine is that capacity to create peace becomes more a kind of shutting things out so that I'll feel peaceful inside, tuning out, zoning out, where I might be at the job, I'm doing my job, I'm doing what I need to do as a parent or a friend, whatever, but I'm not quite there. I've learned to sort of pull back, detach, and give people the minimum requirement while keeping my inner life protected. Now, some people think that's spirituality. There are people who teach how to do that as a spiritual path, how to just zone out and tune out the world. Well, you know, the universe took a lot of trouble to put me into this world, from my point of view. So the, the nine is, is the downside is me becoming peaceful at the expense of my engagement with life and with my loved ones and, and so forth. I'm, you know, having to say these in very simple ways. We, yeah, no, we that's fine. Hours that's fine. or days about any of these, but that that's just the, well, and that's why you're doing a workshop in Baja um, <laughs> in June because you're going to go into depth in so much more depth than we can do here. But let's go to the one. The one is um, very interesting point. Ones are the is the energy of integrity, alignment, integrity, wanting to be congruent so that my word and deed are aligned so that I have the right stuff, so to speak. Ones believe in justice. Ones believe in fairness. Ones want to invite everyone for us to be the best that human beings can be. To sort of, and, and so there's often an interest in ethics, morality, social justice, things like that. Um, ones are when they're in their higher side, they're very compassionate. They can be damn funny <laughs> because they've seen the absurdity of life. But at the same time, there are things that we need to take seriously. There are things that we get so distracted by so much nonsense in life. What is important, asks the one. And what do I give my life to? What am I willing to sacrifice for? That's the one. Mm -hmm. So on their high side, they're moral leaders, they're inspirations to other people, they're um, models of integrity and honesty. They often are people who lead social change, or they could just be teaching us about better health regimens, or how to take better care of ourselves, or how to be more um, considerate when we're on a date, <laughs> things like that. <laughs> um, but the, the downside is that, again, the personality, when we're not present, we get out of touch with the real human quality. And the substitution is the personality trying to do it. So I'm trying to be good, trying to get it right. And it makes me kind of tense, rigid, irritable, easily frustrated. And I know I want to help everybody with this, but why won't they get it? And there's this kind of exasperation, impatience, frustration with myself more than anything, which is not very fun. And so I'm like always beating myself up as an Enneagram one and a lot because I can never be good enough. And when you're saying that as you're, you are a one, is that correct? No, not me. You're not a one. Okay. Okay. Oh. Just to be clear, because someone said here that they thought you were a one, but we're going to ask you a little later, which, which type you are. So we're not there yet. Um, no, no, one, I certainly understand them. And and ones are, and there's all sorts of groupings in the Enneagram. Ones are what we call a, a competency type. Mm -hmm. Like if there's a conflict, I try to solve it by being logical. Uh, eights are what we call emotional realness type. Put your cards on the table. What do you, what do you really feel? Let me know where you're at. And nines are what we call positive outlook. They're trying to inspire, reassure, uh, show us that we got problems, but they're not as big as what we got going for us, yes. right? So those all become problem-solving methods. So there's layers and layers and layers to these. So we turn the corner to two, right? Two is the beginning of the heart triad, two, three, and four. Now that doesn't mean that twos, threes, and fours have more heart and the eights, nines, and ones have more what, body? It doesn't make sense. 
it means that the ego structure of twos, threes, and fours are sort of organized around, constellated around the issues pertaining to the heart. So it's through the heart we feel our value as human beings, the preciousness of our lives. It certainly has a lot to do with love and connection. And it has to do also with, it's through our heart that we feel who and what we really are. So there, those issues are more central for two, three, and four. So kicking off with two, two is um, the part of us where our heart goes out to others. The part of us that seeks real connection, heart connection. The part of us that thinks love and kindness is the most important thing. The part of us that could not restrain from responding if we saw suffering or difficulty or need. You know, we just go to it, uh, whether it's a human or a, a, an animal. You know, it doesn't matter. That caring, holding part that seeks to be connected, that is looking for that communion of hearts, that's the two. So twos make fabulous friends, supporters. They're caring. They, they take care of different things in the world. Uh, they're marvelous friends and allies. Uh, they often uh, do marvelous jobs in organizations because they're aware of what's going on for the other people on their team. Um, they're, so all that's pretty beautiful. And the healthy side of two, I'm also taking care of me. I count. So I'm also, I know when to say no. Like, I know you guys need me, but I was there for you the last three nights and I need a break. Right? So when we get into the fixation, the problematic part of two, we get stuck in it. It's like, I have to be there for you. I have to give, I have to support, I have to connect. Whether or not that's appropriate to the situation and whether or not it's too much for me. So I overflow my own boundaries. Sometimes messing with other people's boundaries, not meaning to, kind of like the eight that way. I just, I just want to get in there and connect and show you that I care about you and I'm there for you, but I'm not necessarily picking up the signal that that's not what you need right now. So that can create problems for me. But it also creates problems for me because I wear myself out, rather like the eight. But in this case, by kind of sacrificing myself for others, for the team, for my partner, for my kids. And so a lot of the two is, is like recognizing, yes, it's really wonderful to be there for others, but I also have to honor my own, the integrity and beauty of my own soul. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times twos, as they figure this out, they have a kind of beautiful renaissance of their own talents and creativity and other things they never had time to do because they were so busy looking after other people mm -hmm. and their needs. So you get, we all know all of it. This is the beautiful thing about the Enneagram types. We all know examples of all of these. And if we're doing it well, you're going to see some of yourself in every one of these, but one of them is going to be like bullseye. Um, so the three sits in the center of the heart triad. Now it's interesting because threes at first blush will not necessarily see themselves as heart people. Threes are doers. Threes are thinkers. Threes look more like eights that way. Threes love getting stuff done. And threes love being effective, efficient. Um, they want people to be proud of them. They want people to see how awesome what they've done is. And when they're in their um, healthier side, they are the people who just get joy out of functioning, doing things, accomplishing things in the world. But they're also present enough and connected enough that they're also deriving the benefit from that, right? Like when we've done a good job, we actually take a moment to let that sink in. Wow, that was awesome. Also means that we enjoy it while we're doing it. We're in what uh, Chigzent Mihai calls flow. We're just, we're in the flow of functioning and it feels so good. There's nothing else I'd rather be doing. This is awesome. And we're also enjoying working with others. And together, we're just accomplishing great things in this world, right? Threes in their high side, like ones, are often an inspiration for other people, but more about personal excellence. 
You know, it's it's like you're an athlete and you're looking at Michael Jordan. Go, yeah, <laughs> I like to be like Michael Jordan. Right? We want to be that kind of person. So that's all beautiful and wonderful. And there's a balance also in the healthy three between my drive to accomplish and my intimate connections. Once things go off balance, I'm drive, 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 and I start to not connect with myself or with others. I just become like a machine getting stuff done where I, in a certain weird way, I don't even matter anymore. And it, when that happens, I be, you know, it's like workaholism uh, where life becomes a checklist. I got that done. I got that. Done. Did you have a good day? Yes. Stop I got talking time. about me. Stop talking <laughs> about me. <laughs> Did you have a bad day? Yeah, I didn't get much done. So there's, there's, it, I get driven and driven, driven until I don't even know myself anymore. And at that point, threes get scared actually to, to do the inner journey because they're terrified there's nothing inside. So it keeps all my attention on forward momentum, getting things done, accomplishing whatever. But I, I then that's when we start joking about things being woo-woo or touchy-feely because we're actually afraid to go that way. But when threes do, it does not diminish their capacities. It reconnects their talents and capacities with their heart, which is the point. So <laughs> four. Um, four is uh, also heart type here. The issue is more about identity. Who am I really? What am I about? And how do I express who I really am? Um, well, first of all, we have to sort of get that we don't start life getting a lot of accurate information about who we are. You know, our parents and teachers and everybody do their best, but you know, if they don't know who they are, how are they going to show me? So there's a sense in the four of wanting to get to the truth of who I am, what I am as a human being, and I want to help you do the same thing. So there's this inner journey in the four, and there's a, a desire to, to be authentic, to express my real feelings, to let you know what's actually happening in me. Um, and when fours are, are in their higher side, they're beautiful at that invitation. They're creative. They're fascinating. They, they bring beauty and intimacy into the world. Uh, they don't always get the fair shake they should have in corporate situations. Corporations don't always recognize how important that is. But God help any group of people that has let this very humanizing part of us go, right? That's not good. So as the high side of that, we're sharing creativity, insights, revelations, and we're helping everybody figure out how to be a true human being. It was pretty awesome. The, the downside of four is I start to be self-involved, self-conscious, I'm so focused on myself that it makes it hard to be spontaneous or to connect with people. And I start to withdraw a little bit. I get kind of moody and petulant. And I and I and it makes it hard for me to be functional in the world because so much of my energy is going into me sorting out my feelings, figuring out where I'm at, figuring out this and that. It, I sort of paint myself into a corner in a certain way. And I can my moodiness can make others, as we say, walk on eggshells around me because they're afraid they might upset me or get me into a bad mood. So that's not the direction we want to go as a four. But the, again, it's the presence that restores the gift. So how am I doing? <laughs> Good. Let's uh, we got we got three more and let's like try to wrap these in five minutes total. Got it. Got it. Got five. Okay. Uh, five is we're moving into the head center now, cognitive thinking, but cognition is more than just our mind chattering. When our mind's chattering, that means we're not thinking. Thinking is a much more mysterious process and it's the capacity to come to an understanding or a knowing that I didn't have before. It's not the regurgitation of old opinions. That's the opposite of thinking. So thinking it has this creative element to it. When we're really, five is about the capacity for us to discover. Aha, oh my gosh, I hadn't seen that before. Wow, that's so amazing. That's so fascinating. So it's that part in us that most little kids have to sort of understand 
reality. Where are we? What the heck is this? Who am I? And we might do that through understanding science or philosophy, but can do it through creativity too. But it's the drive is that seeking to understand the world. Uh, the other interesting side here is that fives are just by temperament are kind of introverted. And so when they're healthy, though, they still like to connect and talk with people and they have their favorites. When they're not so healthy, the impulse is to get away from people, to isolate, because only when I get away from people do I feel like I can think without any interruption, without it being hindered, right? And whatever I'm thinking about is what I'm, I want to spend my time with. Now, it's, I, it would be lovely if it was always something practical and groovy, but it could be about computer games. It could be about my favorite uh, television series. It could be about all kinds of things. But the, but there's this, the five uh, in the problem side isolates and starts to think stranger and stranger things and gets more and more difficult and impossible to live with or relate with. And the five at that stage really doesn't care, doesn't want to be with anybody too much. Uh, there's other sides to it, but again, we, we only have a short time. Uh, that's my Enneagram. I'm a five. Um, and uh, so was Claudio Naranjo, by the way. So it was the Enneagram five. Um, and so is my friend and colleague, uh, Hamid Ali. A.H. Almas is a five. Mm -hmm. So we get interested in exploring frontier kind of stuff. Six. Six is, um, I think it's a short shrift sometimes in the Enneagram literature. And a lot of people don't identify with six right away because why would anybody want to <laughs> the way it's sometimes described? But six is the capacity to pay attention, to be alert, to, to be aware of what's going on inside and out, and then to intelligently respond to what needs to get done with. Um, so sixes are the people who make sure things happen that need to happen and try to prevent things from happening that we don't want to have happen. And they can do that in all sorts of ways. Sixes are cognitive. They love learning stuff. A lot of sixes in law and engineering and in the professions. Uh, but they don't mind getting into the nuts and bolts. They don't need some big, you know, they don't need a spotlight. They just like, they're like the six in liking to get things done or like the three rather, I mean, but they, their, their focus is on trying to create stability, security, safety for everybody. And they can do that through art too. They can, any of the nine types can be creative and artistic. All of them have their own flavor of that. Um, so that's all pretty beautiful. Sixes are also loyal friends and allies. They they vet <laughs> the people in their lives very carefully because they know they sometimes have been kind of suckers for people and they don't want to be that. So they're, they're carefully testing. But once, once they decide that somebody's in there, I'm your friend for life, thick or thin. I'm going to be loyal to you. Um, the downside of and, and downside of six is the anxiety starts to grow. As I don't feel that grounded in the deeper quality of mind, which feels like a steadiness, I start to feel unsteady and uncertain, and I start to feel anxious. And then I'm looking for reasons to be anxious. And as I lose that part of my intelligence that sees what's needed, the mind takes over and starts to imagine potential problems. Because if I can think of the problems, I'll be ready for them when they happen, or I can <laughs> head them off in the past. But then guess what? I'm thinking about problems all the time. When I'm thinking about problems all the time, I get nervous. My life might be great, but it doesn't feel great because I'm thinking this way. My poor emotions and glands don't know that's just in my head, that it's not real. So, you know, I'm getting divorced 15 times a day. My, I've lost my job, you know, because I'm thinking that way. So I get more reactive. I either go towards being cautious, which we call phobic six, cautious and careful, or I get more reactive to it and kind of defiant and risky, risk-taking, which we call counterphobic six. So most sixes have a bit of both, but not always an equal balance. Both will lead to problems unchecked. 
Um, so, and then I get suspicious and ultimately even paranoid because of my tendency to think about what could go wrong or what's negative in the situation. So seven, our last one. Uh, sevens are go-getters. They're out and about like the threes and the eights. But sevens are looking for fulfillment. And most of all, they want to, their big thing, some people say happiness. No, 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 no. Freedom. Mm -hmm. Sevens are after freedom, whatever that looks like to them. Because when we're really grounded in the seven quality, we feel free inside. Our consciousness doesn't have walls around it. Our consciousness feels open-ended, creative, bright and lucid. And that is the inner feeling of freedom. And that's the home base for seven. So to live your life with that sense of openness, possibility, curiosity, to taste and experience everything, that's what my life's about as a seven. And that's what I'm into. So sevens are wonderful at creating and inviting people to experiences. The other thing is the healthy seven, the high side of seven, I realize that that brightness and positivity is what helps us human beings deal with our suffering, deal with our shadow issues. It isn't that I need to just think happy thoughts and stay away from my shadows or darkness. I bring the light to the darkness. I bring my my positivity to my shadow issues. And that's a really important part of what spirituality is. Otherwise, in the lower side, you get a split where I'm trying to stay happy all the time against my shadow issues, which is a prescription for feeling trapped, which triggers more anxiety, more problems. When that happens, sevens get scattered. There are I'm a brilliant, talented person. There's so many things I could do, but I can't decide what to do. So I do a little bit of everything and end up being, you know, a master of none, as we say. And that is a, a painful place to be. So sevens will always try to respond to that by keeping things light, funny, energized, whatever. But it's always against a background of growing anxiety and self-doubt, which I don't really want other folks to see. So, um, and it can get very extreme, you know. So um, all of them, you we want to think of all of them as a range, really, from the highest that we hit on some points in our life where all the beautiful part of it comes forward. And then when we're not so alert or aware how and or kind to ourselves, how we slide into getting really stuck in some of these patterns. So the point of learning it is not to just put yourself in a category, it's to recognize your own way of getting stuck and to recognize the ways out of that. That's the point. Dude, you just talked about nine types, but you're a 10. Yeah. How many people <laughs> think he's a 10? He's a 10. <laughs> That's Russ. two times five, I guess. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so Russ, I'm going to ask one last question before we go to um, audience questions. And, and frankly, audience, put your hand up now. I, we already have three men there. I'd love to see a woman as the next person with a hand up. I um, want to make sure we have good gender uh, balance here. Uh, there we go. Thank you. Here we go. Um, so why is studying the Enneagram valuable for someone in midlife and beyond? What, you know, obviously if you haven't, there's no, no better, no better time than now. That's a good answer. But then there's also, you know, you're coming to MEA and you're going to be teaching and what a depth of experience, the people who are going to go to, to that workshop are going to have with you. You often are doing weekends. It's not always do, that you're going to do like a five night workshop like you're doing with us. So it's going to be very, very deep. But why, why is it particularly valuable as we age? Well, you know, as you ask me that, Chip, the first thing that comes to my mind is in, in the Jewish tradition, the study of Kabbalah was restricted until a person was generally 40 years old. It was thought that, one, you were bound to misunderstand it when you were younger. Two, you're busy creating your business and your family when you're younger, and this would just distract you and create problems. But it was just seen as a wise thing to sort of focus on these other dimensions later in life. So, you know, that's an interesting thing that comes from tradition. 
I don't think as individuals, we exactly decide when we get turned on by this inward journey. But I would say that when we have lived a lot of our life, when we've had some of our most important relationships and we're not trying to figure out what we're going to do when we grow up and so forth, we're in an excellent position to go on a deeper dive into what our soul actually is about. Mm. And so there, there's like, I may have been working very successfully my whole life, but I believe life offers a deeper dive or a second breath into another level of vocation mm. when we are of, at an older age. Mm. And that I find that people who are past midlife, in midlife or past, that are tuned into that tend to have a much more glorious journey and much more richness about the end of their life. The other thing that Gurdjieff used to say that I think is correct, he said, as we advance in years, we start to crystallize what we've lived. Mm -hmm. If we've just been a neurotic mess our whole life, and we're just running after this, that, and the other thing, guess what we're going to be in our later years? We're crystal, we will be crystallized around being a neurotic mess. But if we're taking the time to really take a breath, get our bearings, to sort of look with appreciation and compassion at the journey I've been on so far, to see the patterns, to kiss them on the forehead and bless them for the ways they've helped me, but also now ready to open to maybe some other possibilities. I think the Enneagram is ultimately about opening to possibilities beyond what our presets are. And what I think is the most exciting thing for me personally about this stage of my life is that. Like, what? Well, and, you know, any coach I'd want to have right now, all right, what else is on the menu other than what I've already been doing all these years? You know, I know how to do that bit, but what else is there? Or how can I take what I've learned and developed in my system? in my life and apply it in some way that's truly satisfied to my heart and soul and maybe really making a, another level of contribution. So that, that's kind of how I, I think of it. Mm, beautiful. Yeah. I, 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 <laughs> I will be in the midst of some cancer treatment at that time. So I'm not going to be here for that workshop. Oh. Nicole Sewell will be teaching you with, with you um, as you know, and I just want to say, you guys, this is this man is. I've been studying the Enneagram for forty years. This this is the real truth, and I so appreciate that you're um, you're here. So let's go. We're going to go to questions quickly. So Peter's going to go first. But I, when I say quickly, what I mean is, please just go straight to the question because yeah. there's a lot of a lot of hands up right now. Um, so Peter, why don't you go first? Yeah, thanks, um, Russ. Really interesting. Thank you. Um, so. The Enneagram has different personalities. When you go through the test, you come up with a score. And right. for example, in my case, I am very equal on about five things, right? A little point different than there's a four. So how do you weigh which one, you know, is the one that has one point more, more important to you? Is it the other? So what is the mix of you? Because Great we're all, all of them. So how do I handle that, that I have five which are basically all the same? And okay. some of them are contradictory. Yes. Well, you know, here, here's the little dirty secret of psychological tests. They don't necessarily reveal who we are on the deepest level. They reveal how we see ourselves at a particular time in our life. And as we answer the question, different facets of our personality come up. I devised the the ready test and worked very hard on it to make it as accurate as we could it went through a lot of testing there was a lot of empirical testing of the test but also of the enneagram itself that's another whole topic that we did uh but i would say the test is just an embarkation point it's not the final statement it's just as you go back and look at some of the answers that you gave and or why you went this way or instead of that way. It can be super helpful to do that with someone you know well or with a coach uh, because we. I never thought that it should be a situation where you just take a test and that's it, you're done. 
it should be the launch pad for your self-exploration. And I'd also say this, finding your type from one point of view is the booby prize. So I never tell people what their type is because if I do, I'm kind of ripping them off. The journey to find it awakens something in us. So as you're looking at those five and you're sort of going, hmm, this or that, that you're refining, you're making a more laser-like focus on what are the components of your psyche and how they operate. And you're going to have, of course, a little bit of all of it, but there's something in discriminating what is more primary for you. And not in a lot in life teaches us to look that way. So mm -hmm. this is the invitation for that kind of a journey. So, you know, the, it could be that the one that came out one point higher is it, but I wouldn't necessarily jump to that conclusion myself. Mm. I would say, okay, I look at, take any couple of them and, and read, listen, go online. There's so much stuff and see what, at one point, something will zing you. And they go, all zing me. They, well, <laughs> well. They're, they're all kind of, they're all kind of sobering and wonderful in equal measure. But uh, yeah, so I think. Yeah, just think of it as a launch, and I think you'll be happier with the process. Yes. Beautiful. You. Peter S. Jill, she'll, she'll tell you. Um, so that's his wife. Um, She's right here. I cannot. Uh, okay. Um, let's go to Dilipan. 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 Thanks, uh, Chip. Thanks for us. Um, so my question is, there's a bunch of different schools. I'd love if you can give a short kind of like overview on how the different schools approach, like narrative tradition, the other ones, I know you have your own test. And so when I, whenever I dig into the Enneagram, there are like a bunch of different tests, different schools, different different classifications. So I want to get a read on like how you distill that. Yeah, well, see, once the cat was out of the bag, it started running around. And uh, the, the, ori the origins of this come from esoteric traditions. They come from spiritual schools. Um, I would say the percentage of people teaching this who actually were connected with the source of it is a very small percentage. But that doesn't mean that people studying this for some period of time haven't hit some insights here and there. So most of the schools that have any kind of reputation have something to offer, but they have different aims. They have different purposes. Uh, I was working for years with the Enneagram Institute with Don Richard Riso, but he passed away. And then I just they and I decided we're going to do our own thing while continuing to help each other. Um, I'm friends with the narrative tradition. I would say they are also looking at trying to create a more integrated and balanced approach and a growthful approach. Uh, there are other schools also. Uh, Claudio passed away. Um, Helen's retired. <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of the last man standing from the first wave. Uh, but there are other teachers. My friend Tom Condon uses NLP approach to it. Uh, so there are a lot of different things. I think it's check them out, see, uh, caveat emptor, you know, mm -hmm. let, let the buyer beware, but they all have something, but I would say nobody has the whole market on it. But you can also, the other thing I'd say, observe the manifestations of the teacher. Are they walking their talk? Are they just, are they teaching from their fixation or do they have some freedom from it? Mm. Are they, have they gone on a journey that I can learn from? Is there some way in which, wow, that is representing something I'd like a little bit more of. So there are real people involved and that becomes part of it too, theories notwithstanding. So, you know, there are, I also think that while there's a lot of interesting theories in the end, they have to help you in the middle of life, come back to yourself. And if they do that, that's a helpful theory. Mm, beautiful. Thank you, Pat Witty. How are you doing? I'm gonna unmute myself. Hi Russ, I'll be in your workshop in June. I'm really looking forward to it. Oh, fabulous, but, uh, thank you. Can you talk just very briefly about the holy origins and how they connect to each of the types? Oh, you mean the holy ideas? The is holy, holy ideas? ideas? Yeah, that's what they're called. Holy origin is one of the holy ideas. Yeah. Well, that's getting into very deep water. And, the, and that's 
But that's the beautiful thing about the Enneagram. You can use it on a very basic level. It's kind of like yoga that way. You can learn, you know, seven different poses that you could do in the gym. And that's something. But yoga goes a little bit further than that. If you study its roots and origins and all the yogic teachings, same thing with the Enneagram. So holy ideas are, they're the, dis, what happens in our mind when our ordinary chattering mind relaxes and opens up to the deeper nature of mind. It describes nine kind of vantage points or perspectives of our, you could say our true mind, our higher mind. And so they're all non-dual perspectives. So it's not just one non-dual experience. They're diff- non-dual awareness brings up different elements, different uh, all explain, in relation, Explain different- non-dual just for a second. Okay. It's, it's a, well, you know, when you're looking at the Eastern traditions, they tend to idealize and work with what is called non-dual consciousness, like Advaita Vedanta from the, the Hindu, Hindu or yogic traditions is all about non-dual experience, meaning there's no longer a self and other. There's no longer me and God. <laughs> there's no longer me and you. It's all one. It's, it's a movement to different kind of experiences of the unity of consciousness and being. Buddhism addresses it in a different way. And so do Christian and Jewish and Islamic mystics. So it's, it's an element. And, and the Enneagram, having come out of contemplative traditions, of course, addresses this level of what happens when our mind simmers down what do we tend to open to? And when you can hold or remember the one of these sort of deeper perspectives of consciousness, it helps us get out of some of our habits of mind. So that's that's be my short answer of that. Yeah. There's a lot more to be said about it. Listen, you guys will be talking about it in June. So uh, <laughs> Pat, it'll, that, Pat, you'll be down here around your birthday. That's, that's wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, let's go to Joan. Thank you. Um, You may have partially just answered some of my question. Um, I was wondering during the sessions, during the workshops in Baja, like what would the work look like? And you may be touching on some of those deeper topics, but you talked, I heard, I'm a newbie to all of this. So I heard, you know, the soul and it's like some inner child work and um, also like peeling layers of the onion. You know, how did I get to be? where, who I am and where, where do I want to go in the future maybe? So I was just wondering if you could describe like what those five days would look like from your part of the week. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Well, the way I plan to approach it um, is that we would begin sessions with some kind of centering practice so that we're looking at this from the part of us that can actually help. Uh, relaxing our judgment of ourselves, relaxing that, and then using each of these nine points, not just as as which one are you, and then go up and talk about it. It's, we're looking at from the point of view, as I said, like we we look at point eight, we're going to investigate, what is my relationship with eight energy? How do I run that? It may not be an eight at all, but do I like it? Does it scare me? Do I get bossy? Am I afraid of people who have that energy? What is my deal? And so we do various kinds of exercises and practices. We do what are called inquiry exercises where we explore for ourselves. What is that like in me? We might do a little movement work if people want to. Um, I just I just look at it all as a, like a gymnasium for exploring these different facets of my soul. And, and to look at what the history is, but also to get a, a direct taste of these parts of myself that are like the, w- these gifts in my soul waiting to be discovered and uncovered. So that's kind of how I approach it. That's great. Thank you. That was a great question. Thank you, Joan. Barbara. Hi, Chip and Russ. Russ, I'm good friends with your beautiful sister, Joey. I live in Guilford, Connecticut. Oh, my God. And so I've been a student of Enneagram, and I think it's it's such a, a beautiful, compassionate way of looking at myself and understanding myself and others. So I have a small, I have a private practice where I see clients for forgiveness, and I often use the Enneagram in it because it is a lens from my perspective of compassion for when I'm 
spiraling down or I'm being at a healthier place for myself. Yes. In relationships with my with um, a, a partner, with my children, with all sorts of different people, but it's been especially helpful with my clients, helping them understand and have compassion and forgiveness for when we we you know we when we fuck up, we make mistakes. It's because of the way that because of my seven ish. This is what I do, and um, okay, so Barbara, I just Barbara, am Barbara. so. Yeah, just, we have to wrap soon. So I'm, I'm just sorry. very thankful for that lens. I think it's great. So thank you. Beautiful. Love oh, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, our our last question will be come from Sherry. I'm so sorry to Ray, Alan, Leanne, and Bobby, but um, that's all the time we have. Um, Sherry. Hello. Um, for those of us that aren't lucky enough to get to be with you in June, um, and I'm a beginner, what is um, a good place to start in terms of a test and an analysis? Okay. Uh, the The... The, for a test, I would say that the RHETI, the READY test, is available through the Enneagram Institute, enneagraminstitute.com, uh, and that's the test that I worked on for over a decade, um, and it's the most reputable test. There are others out there which you can check out. Some of them are longer, <clears throat> some of them are shorter. I have a colleague who is a good test in Belgium, but I'm not sure he's done it in English yet. Uh, if you can speak French, it's very good. Uh, I have another one that I know of. A, I have a colleague who is a nice test in South Africa. But um, I would also just advise you beyond just taking the test, just familiarize yourself through books or online um, teachings. Uh, I have an audio book through Sounds True. It's on Audible called The Enneagram, Nine Pathways to Presence, which is taking it more, of course, from the perspective that I'm presenting it with you today. So yeah, just use more than one approach. If if the test may tell you something, but it can raise more questions, which would actually mean it was pretty helpful. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank Great. you. <clears throat> Russ, thank you. Ray, I'm just gonna give you a, do you wanna say one, can it be a one sentence question? Go ahead. Take yeah, thank you. Uh, Russ, real quickly, um, so I, uh, for for those people that we may deal with that that may um, look with skepticism on on the test given its or uh, the Enneagram given its roots, how would you uh, suggest uh, we go about answering that? There's quick quick answer. One is that it's had enormous anecdotal uh, power. So when I teach psychotherapists or business <laughs> leaders, nobody blinks. They say, yeah, that's, you're talking about my mother. Yeah, that's it. Nobody, it doesn't create cognitive dissonance. And if you don't oversell it, make it mean more than it does, you're fine. The only other thing I'd say, we did a, a study through a, a British company called SHL back in the, the knots uh, through a man named David Bartram, who is the top academic psychologist, uh, psychometric expert in the UK, one of the top in the world. And they did a long, interesting study, I can't explain it, to look at the Enneagram itself, not a test. And they were shocked that it was more, uh, when they did statistical analysis, many of the points were twice standard deviation and it came out better than DISC, the big five, or Myers-Briggs. It was more consistent in terms of um, measurable traits that they work with in academic psychology. So we're in that era of we're trying to learn how to teach this in a way where people who want to look at it from these scaling perspectives can do so. But it's, that's in its youth, but the initial discoveries are very promising. Thank you. Yeah. Well, Russ, I think you've given a, a, a just a little am, amuse bouche um, for for the feast that will be happening uh, in June. And uh, I found out earlier that Russ loves Santa Fe, and so who knows in the future, maybe Russ will teach in Santa Fe as well. Um, we we're so honored to have you as part of our our community, Russ. And uh, thank you so much for you know just being able to you know you were able to express what you know with the passion of somebody who just learned it 
today. I mean, that, so that both the, the depth of the knowledge, but also the passion around it and shows that this is, this has many layers to it and you're constantly learning and being curious about what you, what you're supposed to learn in this process as a teacher. So thank you for that. We say that you, we say Tim. that modern modern elders are as curious as they are wise. You are officially a modern elder, Russ. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, Chip. It's been a all blast. Right. I really enjoyed this. Thank all you. Right. Thanks. Thanks, thank everybody. Thank you yes, all for sir. coming. Thanks, everybody. See you Peace soon. Love. Thank you both.